I think I think I decided I made it when I was able to say no to whatever I didn't want to do. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there was there was a time in my life where I had to say yes. You know, I had to say yes to a consulting ag- agreement. I had to say yes to a speaking engagement. Uh, I had to say yes to things because there weren't that many things that came along. And even before I started my own business, you know, there were times I had to say yes to a job I didn't really want to do just because, hey, you know, they're offering me a job, I should take it. And I think another way of looking at the fact that I've made it, whatever that means, is that I I have lots and lots of opportunities that come my way on a daily basis. And the vast majority of them, I just say no to because I've got too much going on. But I think that that's an indication in my mind of some degree of success that um, that I can pick and choose the opportunities that I that I want to do. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. Hey, welcome to the Storytellers Network podcast. I'm so glad you're joining us today for our inaugural episode number one. And in this episode, we're talking with somebody who I've been following for a long time. Uh, I credit him with a big part of starting my career for me in marketing. This guy is just a fantastic human. And, uh, you know, honestly, he's become a, a little bit of a friend of mine, which I'm very proud to say. Uh, we've, we've worked together at a couple of events. Um, I've helped David on a couple of things. Uh, at other events, uh, I hired him with a, with a previous company. I just I love his books. It's been really cool to follow along on his on his journey in the last uh, you know gosh eight years or so that I've known him. So, um, but you know him as a, an author of ten books. He's a marketing strategist, big time in the marketing, sales, and PR worlds. Uh, is the author of the New Rules of Marketing and PR, which has been translated into dozens of languages. He speaks around the world. Uh, he's just a good, smart guy. His name's David Meerman Scott. And today we're talking about his storytelling craft, his successes, and, and some stumbles. In other words, his story. Now, before we get into today's conversation, just a reminder to find us online at thestorytellersnetwork.com for more episodes, for how to contact us, and for other resources to help you tell your story. And if you like what we're doing here, please consider leaving us a review. It helps us to reach new storytellers every day. So thank you for listening, and thank you to our partners. Thanks to Podcast Pilot and to Casterly for supporting this movement so early on. If you want experts in the podcast world, like maybe how to start your own podcast, talk to the teams headed up by the legendary Jamie J. and Sarah Parrish. Now, let's get to the stories. So yeah, joining me is David Meerman Scott. David, thanks so much for taking time to be on the Storytellers Network today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Dan. I'm so glad you're doing this. I'm, uh, you know, when I when I started, I thought, man, I, I really want to be able to talk to storytellers. Of course, uh, your name popped into my head as one of the writers that I wanted to talk to as soon as I could. Um, I, I've read a couple of your books. I love the Grateful Marketing Tales from the Grateful Dead or Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead. Um, of course, I read the New Rules of uh, Marketing and PR way back when. Yep. Um, right. But and then I got the new uh, sales, the new rules of sales and service. I mean, just could go on and on. So, so you certainly came to mind as a writer and a storyteller based on, on all of that. Um, and one of the things that I love about storytelling and about writers in particular, we can be anywhere in the world. We don't have to be in, you know, New York city or LA or something like you do if you're in TV or theater. So <laughs> true, isn't it? right. So with that in mind, uh, where in the world are you geographically right now? Uh, at the moment I am in my home office which is located just west of Boston, Massachusetts in the snow. Oh, boy. <laughs> Excellent. So near Boston in your home office. Isn't it nice that we can do what we do from wherever we want? 
Yeah, it's really great, actually. I travel a lot, as I think you know, to go to speaking gigs, um, which I really love. But um, I really like the idea that I can work from home and um, and and not have to go into an office, which I did for a long time. So yeah. this is fairly new for me, less than a year now. Right on. Yeah, in fact, the part of my question was, are you going to tell me that you're in Antarctica today? Because you've been there. Are you, are you in Turkey today? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I could have said that. I actually much prefer to do interviews, podcasts, and whatnot from, from the office. Um, I, uh, although I have done them from the road, I, I much prefer to do them in my own, my own spot. Yeah. Uh, so when I reached out to you and asked you to be on this thing called the Storytellers Network, um, was that any kind of surprise to you or do you really consider yourself a storyteller by profession? Oh, I, absolutely. 100%. I consider myself a storyteller. That's, that's how I can get my ideas and my um, thoughts out into the world. Uh, you know, it's not so much of delivering information as it is telling stories. And I've always felt that way. Um, the books I write, the speeches I deliver, um, and many of the blog posts that I create uh, are all telling stories. And I, I, found, I found especially that um, that gets the ideas into people's minds in a better way. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot easier for me to tell someone else's story than it is um, to just say, hey, here's some information for you. And so that's um, very definitely something that I see myself doing. And where do you think that started for you, David, kind of being that storyteller? Did you always know it? Or at some point did that kind of hit you as this is what I do for a living? Yeah, that's a really good question, Dan. Um, I, think, um, I think that it really started, um, uh, I think it started on, in my first book. My first book was a novel. and. Um, and so the first book came out, it's called Eyeball Wars, came out a long time ago. And, um, and I realized that I had the power and, you know, it got people liked it and it got good reviews. I had the power to create a story out of thin air that people would relate to. And of course, that's fiction. And then when I started to um, write professionally nonfiction um, magazine articles, I was a for many years, I was a contributing editor to a, a, a magazine called eContent and have um, uh, sent in articles to a number of other publications. That those were really around telling stories and um, telling the stories of other people's success. And through telling the story of other people's success, I was able to get more people interested in my thoughts and my ideas around how marketing and sales should be done in today's world. So you mentioned my book, Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead. Um, I wrote that book with Brian Halligan, who's the CEO of HubSpot, and then Bill Walton, the NBA Basketball Hall of Famer, wrote the foreword to that book. So I found that really interesting. There's an entire book of stories about how the Grateful Dead was a really, set of really fantastic marketers. Like, for example, the Grateful Dead, unlike every other band, um, which said, you cannot record our concerts, you cannot bring a camera into our concerts, uh, you cannot bring a, a tape recorder into our concerts, the Grateful Dead said, sure, why not? Bring your cameras in, bring your uh, tape recorders in. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to have you record the shows. And that proved to be a catalyst to driving interest in what the Grateful Dead was doing. <clears throat> so that idea that I could tell that story, and that's just one story within the book, but I could tell that story about the Grateful Dead. And then people could draw conclusions from that and learn from it. You know, you don't have to be a fan of the Grateful Dead to learn from what they did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's true storytelling in my mind. Uh, and I found that the books that I've written that have had the more storytelling elements have done uh, have done a lot better than than things that I tried to do. Where it's just here's what you do: one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> you know, follow my directions. <laughs> um, so yeah, de absolutely, definitely, the storytelling is the best approach for me. 
And and isn't it funny now that I mean side track here, but isn't it funny that now in the world there are so many like you know, Pearl Jam, Metallica, all these different bands that have well here, download our live show here and like Grateful Dead did it first. <laughs> yeah, they were among the first, absolutely. I mean, I think they probably were the first, but I, there may have been some others that were doing similar things. Um, but absolutely, and in in the, when the Grateful Dead started doing it, it was cassette tapes. You know, that was ages ago. It was from the 19, starting in the 1970s. It was cassette tapes that people were trading back and forth. And uh, the Grateful Dead were totally cool with that. Um, you know, you, you weren't, they didn't want you to sell the tapes that you made at shows. Yeah. But sharing them with your friends, they were happy to have you do that. And the reason, of course, was the more of the Grateful Dead's music that got in the hands of people. Uh, the more likely people would become fans of the music and then the more likely that they would actually want to spend money on concert tickets mm -hmm. actual and, and today as you know just to give you an idea today um, I waited on a virtual line until 10 a.m. to buy a ticket to a duo concert uh, with Bob Weir and Phil Lesh the founding bass player and founding um, uh, guitarist and singer of the Grateful Dead who are doing a special uh, sh set of shows in three cities, um, uh, San Francisco, New York, and Boston in March. And, you know, it, this is 52 years after this band was founded. And there's still fans like me that, um, you know, set their alarm for 10 a.m. in the morning because that's when the tickets go on sale. And, and the $154 for a ticket, it's not cheap, <laughs> you know, and I'm, and I'm happy to get it. Um, and, and that's because we learned about this, me and my friends learned about the band because our friends in university and high school and whatnot were playing the music, which they had the ability to record for free, which the Grateful Dead allows. Mm -hmm. So that, that idea of the story of the Grateful Dead can then be translated to other organizations. The idea of creating content that you give away for free to brand your organization as one that's worthy of doing business with. The story you learn from somebody else, in this case, Grateful Dead, and then the lessons learned are such that you can apply them to your own business. And that's, um, I think, the power of what storytelling allows us to do. Yeah, powerful indeed. What? So something that kind of, as you were saying that made me think, what's the difference between telling stories of other people and then telling your own? Um, good question. So in my case, I tell a few stories about myself, but the vast majority of the stories I tell when I'm on a, on a stage or in my books or in my blog are stories of other people. Because what I like to do is I like to tell a story such that um, it's someone who's achieved success and I like for other people to think that I can achieve similar success. Um, so just as an example, um, I've been telling the story a lot of Matt Reisinger. Matt's a, uh, a uh, high-end custom home builder in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And Matt, um, unlike um, the rest of the builders in Austin, Texas, Matt um, is new, was new to the market. He came to Austin only about 10 years ago from another part of the country. And he was establishing his business and he realized that um, it's really tough to establish a custom home building business. Now he, he builds high end homes between two and $5 million. Wow. And, and for him to compete against builders who have been in the market for 20, 30, 40 years was really tough. And he realized he couldn't do it in the traditional way. So he decided that he wanted to create a YouTube channel, but specifically he wanted to create a YouTube channel where he became kind of like this old house, which is a television show, but on YouTube. And he started that channel four years ago uh, and used some of the ideas from the new rules of marketing and PR. And then I found out about Matt because he tweeted and said, David, I, I can't thank you enough because the ideas that you taught me in the new rules of marketing and PR allowed me to have 6 million YouTube views last year. Yeah. And which is great, right? So then I, wow, I got to talk to this guy. So I interviewed him to learn about his business. 
and he told me that um that he's he's doing great and uh his business is nearly 20 million dollars in revenue now and he's become one of the major players in the Austin, Texas market because of his YouTube channel. And his YouTube channel is the primary marketing uh, vehicle that he uses and what set him, what sets him apart from the other builders and allowed him to rise in um, the group of people who are the very small group of people who can build such a house in the Austin, Texas market so that he's now considered whenever anybody has a chance to build such a house. Mm. So I tell a story like that to show people that, yeah, I mean, anybody can create a YouTube channel and um, I don't want to tell this that story about YouTube about myself. Well, first of all, I don't, I don't have a successful YouTube channel, so I can't, I can't. But if I'm, if I were to say, oh yeah, you know, it's really easy, I can do it. Well, nobody's going to believe that. I'm the guy who wrote the book. Um, but if I say it's really easy, Matt Reisinger can do it. He's just a builder, a professional builder, and he focused his talents on creating this YouTube channel. Well, then they think, well, yeah, maybe I can do the same thing. So from that perspective, that kind of storytelling, for me really works well as a way to educate the audiences in my books and my speeches that they too can achieve similar success. Yeah. That's incredible, man. 6 million views, 20 million revenue. That's awesome. Just out of YouTube. Just really uh, cool. ma mainly focused on YouTube. Yeah. I mean, he can't, attri he can't attribute all of his revenue to YouTube, but, sure. but he's, but he started when he started, no one knew him cause he had just moved to Austin and, um, and he built his business um, primarily based on YouTube. Yeah, that's cool. So, so that kind of uh, showcasing success has got to be a great part of storytelling. But I, I wanted to ask you what you love about storytelling because that's kind of one of or, you know telling stories. That's one of the things that I like to ask on the interviews. But, but, but I want to ask it in this way, David, because you and I had a conversation uh, when when you were in Kalamazoo with me um, at an event, and you made a comment. I don't know if you remember this or not, but you made a comment about how you love the stage and you look at it as a performance that you were, um, that you wanted to be a rock star growing up. Uh, I don't know if you remember this. And he said, yes. this, this is my chance to be a performer. So between writing and being in front of an audience, what is it that you love so much about storytelling? <laughs> right. So, so you're right. Thank you. And thank you for remembering that. I'm a huge fan of live music. I've seen, um, something like almost 700 live concerts in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm a geek. I'm a geek about it and keep this Excel spreadsheet with all my concerts in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and I realized pretty early that I didn't have enough musical ability to ever be on a stage in any significant way as a musician or a singer. So um, being able to be on a stage and, and present in front of thousands of people at a time on a, um, uh, to deliver marketing and sales speeches is pretty close because I treat it, I do treat it like a performance the way that a musician treats a performance. And I, I actually follow really closely what musicians do on stages and emulate some of the things they do in my, in my presentations that, that very few, if any other um, speakers use. Like I, I'm, I, I'm the only speaker that I've ever seen or that anyone, anyone's told me they've ever seen that has climbed up onto a um, speaker <laughs> on the stage. And, you know, that's something I saw rock stars doing. I said, well, why can't I do it? There's no reason why I can't do it at all. And Absolutely. then people, pe people get excited. They're like, wow, check it out. What the hell is he doing now? <laughs> um, you know, and I go into the audience and, uh, and, and, and uh, a lot of uh, very, very few speakers will, you know, go down the steps from the stage and go into the audience. And I, again, that's a technique I learned from rock stars. Uh, so, so yeah, so I find that that's my performance art. But to be able to make that successful, it's got to be in the form of, of storytelling. And, you know, one of the things that, um, that I find really interesting about storytelling <clears throat> in particular is that there's one element that very, very few people put in to their stories. And for that reason, their stories don't do so well. I, f I found one of the most important elements is conflict. Mm. Um, so when you think of a story, you know, whether it's a movie or a novel or a short story, um, that 
when you when you think of the elements that go that go together to create a story, the one of the most critical elements is conflict. You know, if 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 you have a story without conflict, by definition, it's boring, right? Mm-hmm. Um, man meets woman, they fall in love, they get married. That's boring. <laughs> But man meets woman, they fall in love. There's some external factor that comes in between them. Um, They're they're pulled apart uh, in a dramatic way. And then they have to resolve that conflict. They come together. um, They fall in love again and they get married. There's been thousands of movies and books that have written using that plot. Mm -hmm. Because that conflict is what makes it interesting. So when I write story, when I when I create stories for the stage or for my books, I'm always thinking to myself, "Where's the conflict?" And um, so I'll I'll be thinking, okay, so in that story I just told about Matt Reisinger, the conflict comes when um, the other builders are already established. And those other builders don't want him to to enter the market, and they they um, they sort of circle around and say, well, you know, he hasn't been here very long, and he's not going to be a great builder, and blah blah blah. But um, but Matt says, oh, okay, I don't need to play that game. I'm going to play a different game. I'm going to play the YouTube game. Um, so that conflict of in Matt's mind, how can I become a successful builder in a marketplace where everyone else is already established? That's what, that's what makes the story interesting. Mm -hmm. What would, what would not be interesting would be if Matt Reisinger comes to Austin, he establishes a, um, a new, um, custom home building operation and he's all of a sudden he's very successful. Mm. That's boring. That's boring. <laughs> but you, you add the, you add the element of conflict into it, and it becomes more, much more interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's I think most um, people who write nonfiction or who do presentations um, simply don't add that element into their presentations, and that's that, and it suffers as a result because it becomes too boring. Yeah. That makes sense. That's a, yeah, yeah. Conflict has to be there in some way. Or, uh, yeah, it's just a bunch of words strung together. So uh, that's a good. That's a good yeah, tip. pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. So, David, you've written you know, ten books, uh, almost a dozen. There, you've written millions of words online. You've told stories around the world. What's one of your biggest challenges when it comes to storytelling? Do you think the biggest challenge is figuring out which stories I'm going to tell in any with any given audience. I've got um I've got a um a bag full of perhaps two or three hundred stories that I can pull out um in my live speeches. And what I do before I do a presentation, and you've seen me present a couple of times, what I do before a presentation is I say, Okay, where am I in the world? You know, what what country am I in, am I in, for example? What's the audience I'm presenting to? Is it a particular group of people? Is it a particular buyer persona? Um, are they a particular demographic of some kind? You know, and an obvious example is, are, is this a group of people um, who are biz- business to business marketers or are they consumer marketers? That's sort of one permutation of it. Are they in a particular industry uh, or are they more general? Um, so these, I, I look for these, I think, consider these sorts of, um, considerations Mm -hmm. and then I say, okay. Um, so for example, last month I did a presentation in Cairo, Egypt. And so, okay, I'm going to be in Egypt. Um, I'm going to be delivering a presentation to this particular audience of general marketers. Um, and then I think, okay, what are the most appropriate stories that I'm going to be presenting, that I should be delivering to to this group. And it's tough to find the right ones. It really is because there's so many that I could choose. Um, so I also, I, I also try my best to introduce new store, a new, at least one new story in every single speech I deliver. Uh, kind of like the way a comedian and com- many comedians use new jokes in every 
um, in every set that they deliver because they want to see how does this joke go over? Does it make, does this make sense to use in my act going forward? Mm -hmm. And so I try to do that as well. So I find the biggest challenge for me is just choosing which stories to tell. And kind of like a, a rock band, is it hard to get the old stories or the old songs out of rotation? Does that, does that hurt your soul a little bit? It is. Yeah. It's really tough. It, it's really tough. I've got, I've got a couple of things that I've been doing for, for 10 years now and they still work great, which is why I keep them in. Uh, but for somebody who's seen me speak before, they will have already heard that story. So what we you know, I, I do think though that it's similar to a rock um, band where um, the familiarity becomes an important component. So I'll be presenting and um, I'll be able to um, deliver a story and people say, Oh yeah, I've heard that before. This one's great. You know, and people are thinking to themselves or, 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 you know, elbowing their neighbor and sitting next to them during the, the presentation. So I think it's okay, but I, but I, I do, I think it's not okay to deliver word for word, the exact same speech um, mm -hmm. again. Yeah, which is why, which is why I find it so much fun and also difficult to say, okay, I'm presenting, you know, this particular thing, and then what are the, you know, what are the sort of 18 stories that should go in this one-hour speech out of the 300 that I could potentially deliver, um, uh, and then craft it such that those are strung together in a way that makes total sense. And then if there's somebody like you who's seen me speak before, there might be a couple of stories that you will have heard, like the Antarctica story uh, that you've heard a couple of times, but then there'll also be some new stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I noticed too, just, you know, as a, as a fan of yours, um, a follower a little bit, you know, you do tell them differently each time. So kind of like, again, a musician, you know, you're going to play it a little differently each time you play it live. Same thing with your stories. So I, that's a, that's a really good uh, thing for folks to remember. A takeaway there, I think is, you know, change it up a little bit. Yeah, right? I think that I think that's right. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. Do you have as a writer or as a storyteller in general, do you have an inspiration or a muse that really gets you juiced to tell a story? Um, no, not really. Uh, not really. I, um, I, I get very excited about a stage and I psych myself up before I go on a stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a really intricate routine prior to getting on a stage. It, I, um, uh, I, I wake up, I drink some coffee, um, I review my presentation, I do a bunch of yoga um, uh, to get me um, loose and relaxed. Um, I go to the venue early, I walk the stage before the audience has come in, um, I talk to the AV crew, I mean, I'll, I, I just have a very intricate routine that gets me grounded and ready to deliver a speech. And if I'm, if I'm going to be delivering something at 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, that's, that works out pretty well, you know, wake up at, you know, five o'clock, I'm fine. But when I'm at an early start, <laughs> it means I have to, I have to get up really early because those, um, that routine is non-negotiable and it takes a long time to go through that routine. And, you know, I have to eat something, I have to take a shower, I have to get dressed. I mean, so you put all that stuff I do together, it's about five hours. And, wow. and so if I have a seven o'clock, um, actually, there's I, conferences don't really start at seven. But if I have an eight <laughs> o'clock, if I have an eight, eight a.m. start time, you know, you work back five hours. Mm. What is that? I have to, I've got to wake up at three in the morning, right? Wow. Um, and so that's, that's an important aspect of what I do. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Um, why, why do you think we love stories so much as, as humans, as, as, as consumers? Um, oh, I think that's, that's because um, stories have been with us since we've be, since we've become humans, you know, imagine sitting around the campfire 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 years ago, humans only had stories. Um, you know, that's how we communicated. We told the story of the hunt. We told the story of our, of our ancestors. And so, um, it's always been a way that we've communicated and been passed down from generation to generation to generation. 
and therefore is incredibly effective as a as a way of communicating um, business concepts, which is what I do. When did you realize that you've made it, uh, or, or or do you think that you haven't made it yet? Like, what what is your take on <laughs> on making it look like? <laughs> That, uh, huh, interesting. Um, well, I mean, you know, some of the things that have been really um, gratifying to me is that um, I've had three of my books become international bestsellers. Mm-hmm. Um, especially the new rules of marketing and PR has become quite popular. It's it's sold um, nearly 400,000 copies uh, so far, it's in 29 other languages. So um, that's that's really gratifying to me. Um, I think I really felt like, um, I don't know if I made it is the right way to describe it, but I also felt really gratified when Tony Robbins invited me to speak at all of his Business Mastery events. I've been doing that now for four years. I speak at the Business Mastery events around the world, and I have presented in in London and Sydney and, and a bunch of places here in the U S over the, over the years. And that's pretty gratifying because that's at an extremely high level. Tony Robbins is probably the most, um, uh, the, the most, you know, probably to the top number one speaker in the world. I mean, I don't know anyone who's higher than him in terms of delivering speeches mm-hmm. and to have him invite me to speak on his stage for two and a half hours is remarkable. Um, so that was that was pretty cool, but I I never relax and decide that now that I've had this particular achievement that I can just relax and 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 drift and you know rest on what I've done in the past. I'm always looking forward. I'm always looking for the next book. I've done ten books. You know what's the eleventh? Um, and I'm always looking for how I can make my speeches better. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I certainly, you know, I'd like to think someday I, I figure out that like I've sort of made it, I'll never rest, but I, I love that idea of the, that you've spoken on Tony Robbins stage that he, that he invited you to speak on a stage, not just, Oh, I got happened on that, you know? Um, but yeah, you've, you've made it in a way, but there's, there's ne- it's never an end, I guess. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. And then, you know, as you were talking, I just thought of another thing. Um, I think, I think I decided I made it when I was able to say no to whatever I didn't want to do. Um, mm. You know, there was, there was a time in my life where I had to say yes. You know, I had to say yes to a consulting ag- agreement. I had to say yes to a speaking engagement. Uh, I had to say yes to things because there weren't that many things that came along. And even before I started my own business, you know, there were times I had to say yes to a job I didn't really want to do just because, hey, you know, they're offering me a job, I should take it. And I think another way of looking at the fact that I've made it, whatever that means, is that I I have lots and lots of opportunities that come my way on a daily basis. And the vast majority of them, I just say no to because I've got too much going on. But I think that that's an indication in my mind of some degree of success that, um, that I can pick and choose the opportunities that I, that I want to do. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great thing to shoot for. Um, one last question for you, David, I, I, I love this idea of if you could tell one last story, if you had no more chances to tell any stories ever again, what would that last story be for you? Oh my, that's a scary one. Um, <laughs> a last story. The last story. I think I'd like to to tell that last story just to be that that I chose my own path. That um, uh, there was there was no blueprint for what I achieved, and that I um, was able to um, figure out a way to help hundreds of thousands of people along the way, and I had some fun doing it. That's a great, a great story to end on. Well, listen, David, I appreciate your time on the Storytellers Network. I hope the listeners got a lot out of it. I'm, I'm sure they did. Um, but thank you for spending time with us today. My pleasure, Dan. I'm glad you're doing the Storyteller thing. It's, uh, it's really good. It's uh, very needed in the marketplace. Thank you, sir.
Gosh, what a great conversation. Thank you so much, David Meerman Scott, for talking with the Storytellers Network. Uh, be sure to visit David online, which you can find links to in our show notes, webinknow.com, and all the other various areas. If you enjoyed this episode, please cons- consider sharing it all over the place. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, email, text, Snapchat, anywhere you can share with other storytellers is always helpful. And please consider leaving us a review as well. To our partners at Casterly and Podcast Pilot, thank you so much. Thanks for making the world of podcasts a better place. Jamie J and Sarah Parrish and the rest of the team, terrific humans, and you'll be better off knowing them. And without their support, the Storytellers Network would be just a dream. Until next time, here's to telling our stories and having stories to tell.